Well, last time we reviewed with you the underlying components of the Feast of Tabernacles, the, and the purpose being to give you something, and I recommend you seriously that you do this, that you continually go back over that and review it and review it, because what we did was to express to you the major components of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, there may be a few more that we'll see as we go through. That indeed can happen. But these were the major ones. I think we ended up with 15. Uh, these were the major ones that uh, I urge you to keep presently in your mind so that, number one, when you're searching scriptures, you'll be able to see, yes, this is that. And secondly, when you are, when someone asks, well, what, what do you believe about the Feast of Tabernacles? What does it mean? How is the Feast of Tabernacles different from Pentecost or Trumpets or the Day of Atonement? You'll be able to express it in terms that can be found in the New Testament. What we have not done, I kind of showed you the beginning by introducing all this, and then I kind of showed you the ending. What remains to be done is actually closure. And, and we want to bring closure to these concepts primarily through three basic mechanisms. One, we want to look at the Old Testament and see what it says to gain a sense of its typology. The second thing, which is actually quite useful to do, since tabernacles is the fullness of all things, you can go to Revelations chapter 21 and chapter 22 and look at the end of the matter. You can see, if we're talking about the goal, then we can look at what God ends up with. And that correspondingly must be what he decided needed to be the end of the matter. And so when you, so that's the second aspect. Then the third aspect is that we want to then go through the New Testament and see specifically several things. We want to see the specific references to the Feast of Tabernacle as well as references to the concepts that are suggested both by the end of the matter in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 and by the Feast of Tabernacles proper, uh, as it's described in uh, the original feast, the original Feast of Tabernacles. So those are the three components that we want to get closure on. We want to look at the original Feast of Tabernacles. I'll just do this briefly. We want to look at Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 to get a, a savor of that. And then most of the course is going to be spent on this third component, and that is going through the New Testament and seeing how it relates directly to all of these things that have suggested. And I urge you to well, let's keep our feet to the fire in the sense that we, we want to be sure that we are expressing what it is the scriptures say. And please, if we say anything, if we draw some sort of conclusion and you'd like either, you know, where's that in the Bible or some other explanation, don't hesitate, because that's, that's where the strength of these things are, are found. And if I uh, can't remember or don't know, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll help look. Because we are not interested in just exploring things to, to be fancy and, and to entertain. The, what, what Our burden here is to open the scriptures, to unearth things that have been hidden from the church in general as long as the Bible's been written, there have always been individuals throughout church history that have understood these things and experienced these things. But in general, the church of Jesus Christ at large, worldwide, does not understand these things. And so correspondingly, we don't want to stand in line and, and suggest some new doctrine. We don't want to be inventive and cleverly uh, unusual, which is, that's the style today. If you can just kind of be cleverly unusual, you will capture a following. We are not interested in that at all. We want to show you in this specific instance that the Feast of Tabernacles is a dominant burden of the New Testament. A dominant burden of the New Testament. Any questions on that? Let me just review briefly. We're not going to read Revelations chapter 21, chapter 22, but I would urge you to. And look for the components that are, uh, that are present. This is what I, I, I made a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine things that I'll just read to you that I find present in Revelations chapter 21 and chapter 22. Uh, I find a bride and a wife. That 
says to me that therefore this is the end of the matter. This is what God has designed. He, he does away with the first heaven and the first earth. He creates a new heaven, a new earth. And what is he left with? A bride, a wife. He's also left with a new Jerusalem. He's left with a city, which is a temple. It's a tabernacle. He's left with nations. There are walls and gates and foundations. There's a river. There's trees. There's light. And there's a throne. As well as jewels and other such things. But the, those are the main components of what God dramatizes as the perfection of all things. And so correspondingly, we're not surprised that a number of these things we have already, uh, we have already alluded to. So keep that in mind. That since God has a goal in mind, that's why it's number seven, that the process of today, of being a Christian, of living in Jesus Christ, the purpose of that process is to produce this end, is to produce those walls, to produce the foundation, to produce the city, the bride, and the tree, and the river, and, 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 every, and the nation, so that they are all intact as foretold. So let's begin, uh, in the Old Testament, let's begin with Exodus 23, 23.14. Three times shall you keep a feast unto me in the year. The first time, and, and we'll see this in Leviticus 23 as well as uh, Deuteronomy 16. The first time the males of Israel keep the feast is the feast of Passover. Sometimes it's called unleavened bread. And the first three feasts are celebrated. Pan, uh, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. The second time they meet, they celebrate only one feast. This is seven weeks later at Pentecost. Then the third time they meet, they celebrate the final three feasts together. <clears throat> they celebrate trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and tabernacles. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded you, in the time appointed in the month of King James says Abib, it's Aviv. The same word as Tel Aviv means a spring. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labor, see that's Pentecost, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is at the end of the year when you have gathered in thy labors out of the field. Things starting to click. That's when you bring out your highlighter and uh, you, know, you highlight things like end of the year, gather thy labors, and uh, so forth. Three times in the year all thy mail shall appear before the Lord God. And the reason why I believe it's, it's all the males is God intends of, for all Israel to be fully redeemed. And unfortunately, many will not hear. Unfortunately, many do not hear. Jesus said, I want you to go to the nations. I want you to teach them. I want you to teach them. I want you to make disciples. And then Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 describes all seven feasts of the Lord. But in particular, we're looking at verse uh, 34. I'll leave it to you to go back and find the others. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation, and so it is today. Sukkot, the first day of Sukkot, is Shabbat. It's a Shabbat because of the next phrase, you shall do no servile work therein. So it's the same as uh, our Saturday. Seven days shall you offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, and on the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. Now we'll, we'll look at the relationship between the, this 
the solemnness of it and the uh, the joy of it. This this is not a solemn occasion as it is in the Day of Atonement, where you don yourself with sackcloth and repent. This is solemn because it is a day in which you you're careful. You approach it soberly, but it's a, it, it's a day of great joy, especially the eighth day. And you shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. And that is your job, to declare these as holy convocations, every one of them. They need to be spoken of as they pertain to redemption. To offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Everything is tested by God, by, by the fire of God. And the fire of God is always present and is always probing and burning all that is a candidate that's going nowhere. All wood, hay, stubble. And a meat offering. Now, meat in the King James invariably should be replaced with another word. You can replace it with food. It just simply is food. Or possibly the word meal, M-E-A-L, like in uh, uh, bean meal or, uh, you know, what's another word for meal? Like oatmeal, those are meals. Cornmeal, we say we eat a meal. It's, it's, that, uh, it's that sense. It's a meal offering. It's food. It's, a, it's not a meat offering. It's not steak. It's, uh, it's a food offering. Food is offered. A sacrifice and drink offerings and everything upon his day. Beside the Sabbath of the Lord, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your free will offerings which you have given to the Lord. This is required above everything that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to have the Shabbat. You're supposed to offer your gift to the Lord. You're supposed to make your vows before the Lord. And you're supposed to give all your free will offerings. This is something in addition to that. And because you do this, you don't leave the other undone. Verse 39. Also on the 15th day of the seventh month, same, same month, same day, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, and it's a marvel you can watch the devout Jew follow this commandment because when they go to select the leaves to make their Sukkot they inspect them very very carefully they look at every every leaf on these branches turning on both sides and as you as you walk through uh, the, the Shuk which is market in, in Jerusalem a few days prior to the Feast of Tabernacle, you see them very, they'll, they'll pick up one great big uh, palm leaf and leaf by leaf inspect both sides. They want to make sure it's a goodly bow. And why? Because God says that's what you do. That's what you do. I don't want no junk around here, so to speak. I want, this is, I want your finery. I want your best. And it takes time. It takes time to give your best to God, doesn't it? Don't give him second best. God hates the offering, you know. He say, well, this bull's a little sick. I might as well give it to the Lord. God says, no, you keep that one. You give me your best one. Isn't that amazing? The Lord, the Lord just demands your best. So give him the goodly bow. Branches of palm trees and the boughs of thick trees and the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. This is a time of great care, and yet it's a time of great rejoicing. It's, in a way, it's, it's a counterpart to our Christmas, in a way. Uh, Christmas is not ordained of the scriptures, by the way. So in that sense, our Christmas is, <laughs> is a counterpart of nothing. But in the sense that it's a family time where things are decorated, and they, uh, they build these uh, outdoor booths called Sukkot, Sukkot is plural. One is called a sukkah. And they, uh, they put fruit inside, and uh, the children decorate it with streamers and uh, paper chains and little ornaments. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the same kind of a celebration that, uh, that, that we know of here. 
And you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Verse 42, you shall dwell in booths seven days. That's the tabernacling. See, that's the dwelling in Christ. All that are Israelites born. How about you? What's your testimony about your birth? Shall dwell in booths. Isn't that wonderful? Let's look at uh, Numbers chapter 29. Numbers 29, down around the uh, 12th verse. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Simple one, but I think you'll notice something. You know, sometimes you read these chapters and you kind of yawn between <laughs> verses. <laughs> Don't yawn. Say, now, Lord, there's got to be a reason why you are paying so much attention to these things and why you require such little things. The tabernacle itself is a perfect example. These rings and tenons and fillets and every one of these things have significance. So uh, I'm not going to ask you f for the significance. See, this is Numbers 29. I'm not there yet. 29, 12. But I do want you to make a table, and uh, let's read it, and then you'll see. Uh, we'll see what the table uh, means. Notice if you go back to verse 1, on the seventh month, on the first day of the month, is the blowing of trumpets. Uh, Rosh Hashanah is on the first day of the seventh month in the Jewish calendar. And then verse 7, you shall have on the tenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, afflict your souls, that's Yom Kippur. So the first day of the month is trumpets, the, set, the uh, tenth day of the month is the Day of Atonement, and then the fifteenth day of the month is tabernacles. And so you go from the, from the feast that is the most awesome, the Day of Atonement, to the feast of, the, of, of greatest joys in, in just a few days. So verse 12. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. You shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. And you shall offer a burnt offering, a sacrifice made by fire, and a sweet savor of the Lord, for, uh, uh, unto the Lord. Thirteen young bullocks, two rams, and fourteen lambs of the first year. And they shall be without blemish. And their food offering shall be a flour mingled with oil. Three tenths deals unto every bullock, and the thirteen bullocks... A bullock of the thirteen bullocks, two tenths deals to each ram of the two rams, and a several tenth deal to each lamb of the fourteen lambs, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering, besides the continual burnt offering, his uh, meat, meal offering, and his drink offering. Day one. And on the second day, you shall offer twelve young bullocks, two rams, fourteen lambs of the first year without spot, and their meal offering and the drink offerings for the bullocks and the rams and for the lambs shall be according to the number after the manner. And one kid for the, of the goats for a sin offering besides the continual burnt offering and the meat. And this is about when you start yawning. And the food offering and their drink offering. And on the third day, 11 bullocks, two rams, 14 lambs in the first year without blemish, and their meal offerings and their drink offerings. Well, let's see. Let's go ahead to someplace else in the plan. I want you to read through this chapter, all the way through, let's see, was it verse 39? That says, these things shall you do unto the Lord in your, in your set feast, and this besides your vows and your free will offerings and your burnt offerings for your food offerings and your drink offerings and your peace offerings. This is what I want you to do. And what I want you to do is to make a table that shows day by day what was offered. So across the top of the page, I want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you'll have seven columns that proceed down. And then on the left-hand column, I want a listing of everything that, that could possibly happen. Like a bullock gets offered, or a ram, or fire, or whatever. And then annotate where those two intersect, what happens. For example, if it's two rams on the first day, then put a two there. If it's two rams on the fifth day, put a two. If there's a day where there are no rams, then just don't put anything, or, or put a zero. And, and, and see if you can create a table which annotates the instructions that we just began to go through uh, between these two verses. It'll take you, it's about 10 minute, uh, 10 minute task, but I'd like you to do it before next week. 
because there's, I want to show you two things. I want to show you that it takes diligence to understand the things that God has. See, God hides these things in there. The next thing you know, you start yawning because you figure there's nothing there, just more rams and bullocks and, you know, corn and oil and this and that and this and that. It looks like it just keeps repeating and ho-hum, but I want you to pay attention. That's the first thing. And the second thing, there is a wonderful symbol there. Which, uh, which was one of the fifteen that we mentioned. Yes. So, in other words, you want to go look on the chart and say, seventh day, how many rams? Do you want? Yeah, seventh day, how many rams? Or was there any day when fire was not offered? Or uh, you know, I want to be able to see day by day. Uh, I want a synopsis, an accurate synopsis, so that I can tell day by day what was offered, what happened. Where you've got, you've got days going on the last side. Uh, days across the top, day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven across the top, that creates seven columns that go down the page. And then down the left hand side of the page list, you know, things like rams, meal offering, oil, fire, anything else that you can find in there. Some things may only happen once, some things happen every day, some things change every day, some things are the same every day. And then what I want you to do is to look for the most dramatic aspect of that table. And you'll, you'll, you'll start seeing, and once you get to about the third day, you'll start suspecting that you have an idea what's happening. But when you're done, you'll see, of a truth, this is, this is what's happening all right. Okay, any questions on that? Good. Okay, the next time uh, the Feast of Tabernacles is mentioned in the, the Old Testament is in Deuteronomy 16. And like Leviticus 23, you should know Deuteronomy 16. When you're understanding the Feast of the Lord, those are the two dominant descriptions. Each of the feasts are described elsewhere throughout the scriptures kind of, they, they show up at, at, at unusual places, and so you have to be, you know, carefully use a concordance to search them all out. But if you're looking for, um, for consistency, they are both described the best in Leviticus 23 and also in um, Deuteronomy 16. So we want to go down to verse 13. <clears throat> Three times a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord, thy God, in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And what feasts are celebrated during the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Passover, Unleavened Bread, and first fruits. You need to memorize that. It's called Unleavened Bread because they are days of Unleavened Bread. But they comprise, the days of unleavened bread are comprised of three feasts. Elsewhere in the scriptures, those same three feasts are called by the name Passover. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread and in the Feast of Weeks, who can tell me why it's the Feast of Weeks? Because you arrive at that by counting weeks. You count seven weeks plus one more day giving 50 days. And it's uh, uh, Shavua is Hebrew for week. Shavuot is plural, like Sukkah is singular and Sukkot is plural. It's the same thing. Uh, it's called Chag or Feast Shavuot of weeks, Feast of weeks. So you may hear it called Pente Pentecost, which is the Greek name, or uh, Shavuot, which is the Hebrew name for the same feast and in the Feast of Tabernacles. So these last three are called by the same name. By call, uh, the last three are called by the name of the last feast. They shall not appear before the Lord empty. Uh, let, let me go back um, to verse 13. I, I jumped ahead here, sorry. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after that, after that you have gathered in your corn and your wine. And you shall rejoice in your feast. Notice it's your feast. I like that. The, there are the feasts of the Lord, but 
Notice how he invites participation and gives ownership. Rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter. See the family there? Your maidservant, your, your manservant and your maidservant and the Levite and the stranger. See, there's the Gentile and the fatherless and the widow that are within thy gates. And I think that's why the rabbi greeted us during the Feast of Tabernacles, because they would consider our coming as a fulfillment of Deuteronomy. We are strangers. We certainly are not of the Commonwealth of Israel. You know, we are not circumcised. We don't ob observe their observances. We worship the same God. We revere the same scriptures. We're different, though. We are strangers. And yet we are within their gates rejoicing. Not so much at their invitation. So I think that they consider God must be doing something. And we feel the same. We feel God is doing something. What? Where is this desire coming from? <laughs> I mean, why not go to Honolulu or something? You know, there, <laughs> there are other places to go in the world you want to go and enjoy yourself. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The stranger. I love that. Seven days shall you keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord shall choose. And where is that place? Well, uh, but what's the place here? Jerusalem. That's right. Because the Lord your God shall bless you in all your increase and in all your works of your hands, therefore you shall surely rejoice. There is great rejoicing when you see personally God blessing the works of your hands. When you realize, Lord, I said that, or I did that, and you touched it and caused it to blossom. See, then it becomes a, a candidate for a harvest. Say, you shall go forth. How's that scripture go? You shall go forth rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. That's real. It doesn't sound real to us now, but in tabernacles, it's real. When you see the relationship between that which is done and blessed of God and your role in it, before tabernacles, it appears as though you can do no good, you can't get anything done right, it's this, it's that. But, you know, henceforth there is laid up for us a treasure. There's a treasure being laid up. And that treasure is the reward of your, is, the, is itself the very works of your hands, blessed by God. And we don't see the blessing. But in tabernacles you do. In tabernacles is where these works then become manifested. Just, just like in a harvest. When you sit and there is the barn filled with oil and corn and wheat and barley and and everything is, uh, and all your cattle, and you realize, you know, that that corn was produced because I planted and I plowed. And God saves the best until last. He re, His reward to you is when the work is done. You work a week, you get paid a week's wages. You spend your life, and the Lord rewards you. A life spent. A lifetime reward is, is granted. And in tabernacles you see that firsthand. Firsthand. And a lot of things that we have done, we've forgotten. Most of us have forgotten. The little acts of kindnesses, the things that we felt were prudent at the time, sacrifices that we made. We, we made them with joy, thought nothing of it. Our humility prevented us from gloating or elevating it and so we've just kind of dismissed it but God hasn't forgotten not at all and every one of them is kept in store every one of them has been harvested and in tabernacles the door is open and you you'll look in and either see a threadbare empty barn because you spent everything on yourself or 
a barn, you know, the, the, the press that is overflowing and the barn that's bulging. Because God does not forget. God does not forget one word. You know, blessed are the peacemakers. See, and every time, you know, there's tension and you say something that relieves it and, and makes it makes it easier for people to get along, you are blessed. You have sown and that the uh, the thing that is harvested is peace. And that measure of peace is reserved for you. And when that barn is open, you receive the fullness of that very peace that you sowed. It's the labors of your hands that you worked that was blessed by God. It's that real. It's that real. The wife of the lamb is clothed in a garment of her own righteous deeds. See, we shall all stand before, before the judgment seat of Christ to receive in our body the things that were done, both good and evil. It's tabernacles. It's the, it's the reconciliation of all things. Isn't that wonderful? How far did I get? That was 15. Okay, now here we go. <clears throat> 16. Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord in the place that he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Weeks, Feast of Tabernacles, you shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able. And God does not expect heroism where you do more than, uh, than could possibly be required. It's as you are able. Freely you have received, freely give. He expects you to be able to give in direct measure as it has been given to you. Say, give, and it shall be given to you. That's how you, it's given to you and you give, and it's given to you. See, that's, that's why seed can multiply in the saint. God makes his deposit. You work with it obediently. It brings fruit, and that fruit is returned. And it becomes another deposit. It bears more fruit, and it grows. And we look to the greatest, uh, the greatest one of all. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. And the gospel then becomes what it is intended to be. So the gospel means good news, and it actually becomes good news. It begins as good news, and then we get a case of the dreads and things don't quite go right and once in a while we have a season when things are pretty good and then we get a couple of seasons where just just everything breaks loose and it just looks like nothing makes sense but the gospel is a blessing and the end of the matter is what is important to the Lord and the end of the matter is better than the beginning thereof and the patient in spirit is better than the, pri the proud in spirit then let's look at Deuteronomy 31, verse 10. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, this is Jubilee. Well, I'm sorry, this, well... Every seven years is, is a Sabbath year. Jubilee is actually a Sabbath of Sabbaths. When all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place that he shall choose. See, his will is important here. You shall read this law before all Israel for their hearing. The Feast of Tabernacles is a time in which all that God has spoken comes to clarity. Before this, things tend to be here a little, there a little. We love this verse, we love that verse. But tabernacles being the fullness of, of all things, what happens is that you have the fullness of the law of God. In fact, what happens on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel relating to the fullness of the law? It's called Simcha Torah, rejoicing 
in the law or rejoicing of the law. What do they do? They dance around with the, the Torah and rejoicing, but why? God has given them a, a full year where they've been able to read it, study it, and enjoy it, and look forward to the beginning of the next year. Yes, and what, uh, that's correct, and one thing needs to be added to it. They read the law for the year. And on Simcha Torah, they rewind the scroll at the end of the year. And they look forward to the beginning of another year. They roll the scroll back to the beginning. See, you don't have pages. And you, uh, you continually turn these knobs and you keep presenting a new passage, new passage. And this is done throughout the year. And the last is read on Simcha Torah, and they rewind the scroll. See, all of the law has been read. And that's what this is. Thou shalt read the law before all Israel in their hearing. So they are very diligent in that, to make sure that the law is, uh, the law is heard. And the same is true for us, isn't it? You begin to realize this scripture really means what it says. Gather the, te the people together. Men and women and children and the stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and to observe, to do all the words of this law. Tabernacles is the time where you learn to do all of the words of this law. Remember we mentioned the keeping of the commandments of God. Tabernacles produces a devotion, a genuine and a sincere love of God that is unknown to us. Our first love, when we first come to the Lord, is a good representation of it. It's like Jesus, he's wonderful, he can do anything, he's, he's just marvelous, and our, just, our heart just goes... And uh, gets twitterpated, we used to say. Just goes, wow, Lord, I love you. And then something happens. You know, little icicles start to grow. And, uh, uh, and basically, when the icicles grow, you stop doing what God wants you to do. The and the honeymoon's over. Well, the good news is there's another one coming. And God rekindles this love. If you'll follow him, he will rekindle this love. And the result of that love will be to do his will from the heart with great rejoicing. That's why there's this emphasis to observe and to do all the words of the law. We'll see this in John 14 when we, when we get there. And that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. This is a tremendous aspect of the Feast of Tabernacles dramatized in the New Testament by the rivers of water. Out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And that is the purpose of the waters are for the benefit of others who have never heard, others who have never known. You, because of your faithfulness in seeing the full expression of redemption in tabernacles out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water and we see in revelations chapter 21 22 this river of life and the tree of life growing by it so that the nations can be healed see those who never knew those who didn't know God has a provision for them in the Feast of Tabernacles and one of the reasons why the nations have not seen the light of God in Israel is because we do not have this river flowing. We have not fulfilled the Feast of Tabernacles where the children of God, so to speak, and, and we'll look at the, Jesus referred to this in John, says so the children that haven't known his way. It's the Gentiles who don't know the ways of God. And the, pers the purpose of Tabernacles is so that they do. And they'll, they'll, they'll hear They'll learn to fear the Lord as long as you live in the land, whether you go over to Jordan 
to possess it. As long as you stay in the land of promise, as long as you don't quit, as long as you are the full expression of all that God has called you to, this process continues. This river, this life that flows, this tree whose leaves are for the healing of nations. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Second Chronicles 8. Second Chronicles 8, verse uh, 13. This is Solomon. Now, some history has passed, and after Joshua there arose some judges, and uh, not everyone served the Lord. But in this regard, Solomon celebrated, observed uh, these feasts. Second Chronicles 8.13. Let's go back one. Then Solomon offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the porch, even after a certain rate every day, according to the commandment of Moses on the Sabbath and on the new moons and on the solemn feast three times in a year, even the feast of unleavened bread and the feast of weeks and in the feast of tabernacles. And Solomon represents the king of kings. Solomon represents the kingdom that has come to be at peace. Remember, God said to David, you can't build the temple. If we're talking about the temple of God. You can't build a temple because your hands have seen war. I don't want it built by a man of war. It has to be built by a man of peace. And Solomon was that man. And so Solomon represents the kingdom. It represents the millennium. It represents that which has produced, the building of God, which is produced after all the destroyers have been destroyed. And so it's no surprise that we find in that type that Solomon also celebrates the Feast of Tabernacles. But let's go to Zechariah 14, because what we've read uh, previously, we read the law concerning the original Feast of Tabernacles. We saw Solomon kept the feast. It's not clear to what extent, other than the history of the Jewish fathers, how this feast has been kept alive throughout the many centuries. But Zechariah 14 is, I'll start reading at uh, verse 16. This is prophetic. This is what the prophets say about the Feast of Tabernacles and correspondingly points to another day. And we're suggesting that in the kingdom-wide fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, that that day is at hand. And if you go back, say to verse 12, it says, and this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Remember, tabernacles has to do with Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet. Who was the, uh, who was the guy in the New Testament that magnified himself as God and, uh, and is... Uh, what, his tongue get all eaten up or something happened to him? Yeah, he was all filled with worms, just like just like in a moment. He was just completely consumed uh, with worms. So this, uh, they're consumed while they're, uh, what, they're, their flesh is consumed while they're still on their feet. That's how, that's how quickly it happens. They don't uh, start to succumb and, uh, and, you know, buckle and finally collapse and then are consumed while they're standing, right in, right in the very height of their arrogance. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. Now, by the way, do you think this has happened yet? This day has not happened yet. And and it shall come to pass in that day that a great multitude, a tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold of every one in the hand of his neighbors, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah shall also fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall the plague of the horse and of the mule and the camel and the ass and all the beasts shall be in these tents as this plague. So that's the setting here. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations, nations, 
which came against Jerusalem, so they're not completely wiped out, some survive, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Remember we read the Feast of Tabernacles is the statute forever. It's going to be kept year after year. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth. I like that concept, the families of the earth. See, no longer them Gentiles out there. See, these are, these are the strangers that are now rejoicing in the gates. These are uh, family, but the family of the earth. See, they're being reconciled to God through the Israel of God. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And we'll spend some time that that corresponds to the uh, to the water. There are rivers and streams and fountains and oceans and and uh, rain. There's all kind of water, uh, as we'll see. And if the family of Egypt, notice it's not the heathen of Egypt. That's so important. Because the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles is to establish a testimony and a presence of the Lord here on earth such that the family of the nations can be drawn to the light of God and be redeemed. And if the family of Egypt go not up, that kind of figures, doesn't it? They're not going to remember the uh, Camp David Accord. And come not that have no rain. In other words, if that's not enough, there shall be the plague. The Lord is going to enforce his will. Wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feasts of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The presence of God in Jerusalem will be an expression to the entire world. It will be a beacon. And if they will not respond to it, first comes no rain. And those, that part of the world, all parts of the world, need rain. If that doesn't do it, here come the plagues. Can you imagine that? And here we thought uh, the millennium would be nicey-nice. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, I see the, the, uh, the ruling here is with a rod of iron. God will enforce his will. See, now what tends to happen is God makes sure the nations keep on course. He sets the bound. They can't extend it one inch, not one inch, without his divine expression. It's impossible. He maintains the, he maintains, he maintains the bounds of the ocean. A wave cannot lick one extra inch of sand without God's express permission. An ordination. See, he upholds all things by the word of his power. But in these days, God has set a lamp in Messiah and is inviting everyone to come. But other than uh, some, uh, some, there are some exceptions when nations rise up against um, the will of God and God smites the nations. By and large, the Lord deals kindly. Remember Jesus said he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. 
That's the season that we are in now. He sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. I fear for something like the United States that those days are drawing to a close. And it's because the United States is being wicked and with and resisting God. And God is going to resist this nation. But God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Until the tabernacle is established and the Feast of Tabernacles is restored, then this light that could only be seen by some and were responded to by some will now be a beacon for the whole world. And then no more will the rain be sent on the just and the unjust. Then, because the Feast of Tabernacles has been restored as an eternal testimony before all the nations, those that will not come, a direct intervention of God. It's kind of like the way it used to be when you were children. You did something wrong, you got spanked. And the world is really used to God not spanking quite so directly. And that's why they exploit and explore and, and, uh, and, uh, and add perversity to perversity. But not in that day. You don't come, no rain. You still don't come, a plague. In other words, he will insist through the process of pain and, uh, and destruction on them attending the Feast of Tabernacles. Isn't that something? Wouldn't that be a marvelous day to see? See, now the heathen rage and they exalt themselves. See, they you know, let us cast his cords from us. Not in that day. See, and once Tabernacles has had its full expression among God's elect, then that portion of the purpose of history has been fulfilled. And then God can turn to the nations. And you'll, we'll see this in John 17. Lord, I, Father, I pray not for them. I pray for the ones whom you have given me. The idea is, you know, the, the rest are for another time, and they are for another time. This time is for the perfecting of the saints. For the elect of God to be called out of the earth, to be joined to God in fullness, and out of that will come the redemption of the world. And that's what Jesus says, that the, that the world may believe. Without that, the world won't believe. And so correspondingly, God is not in the habit of smiting every nation every time it does something that's ungodly. He has compassion. There are limits, obviously. The Roman Empire was brought to its knees. The Aztec Empire was brought to its knees. The Babylonian Empire was brought to its knees. The Persian Empire was brought to its knees. Alexander the Great was brought to his knees. The Moroccan Empire was brought to its knees. The British Empire was brought to its knees. God sets limits. But by and large, his attention is not to the nations, other than the calling to the nations, an elect to himself. So that that elect can find its full expression in the Feast of Tabernacles, such that a light is demonstrated to the world, such that the world can benefit. We receive the waters of life, and God gives us a portion of history to do so, such that those waters may flow from us. And we have an experience in Tabernacles where we learn that, where we are transformed from being water receivers from Pentecost to water givers in Tabernacles, such that the nations can drink of this water. And then at that time, oh, you don't want to come and drink? We'll see. Praise the Lord. There's, uh, you know, we rejoice when we see the wicked dealt with people who get away with things that there's something inside man that loves to see justice and the day that is coming after tabernacles has been restored will be a day of justice and that in itself will bring great joy and in that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the lord and the pots in the house in the lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. What do you think that means? What's the difference between a pot in the Lord's house and a bowl before the altar? 
See, the pot is the is the lowly vessel. It's the vessel that uh, gets dirty. No one keeps it clean. It's, a, it's not a vessel of honor. But the things that are kept on the altar, they are kept spiffy, sharp, clean, holy. And that day, the lowliest of vessels will be as clean and spiffy and as remarkable as the things that were holy. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem, the vessels, clay vessels, containers for the Lord, the temple of God, a booth, a sukkah. Every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanites in the house of the Lord of hosts. No more a mixed multitude. All will proceed purely, purely from what the Lord does. So, one more, and then we'll close, and that's from Ezra, chapter 3. Ezra and Nehemiah were responsible for the rebuilding of the wall and the temple after they returned from Babylon. It's a picture of the last days. And in Ezra 3, 4, uh, well, let's go back one again. And they set... The altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings thereunto unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom as the duty of every day required. You will find the expression of the Feast of Tabernacles present when God wants to indicate that the process that is engaged at that point is leading to it. And so this case here, it's the rebuilding of the walls and rebuilding of the temple of God. And that is when the Feast of Tabernacles is kept like it's never kept before, when the temple of God is finally rebuilt. So the presence of God tabernacles in a, in a vessel that has been properly prepared. Well, this is how the Feast of Tabernacles was kept originally. And as you can see, we've already seen many things that apply.